12.30, let's get started. Surprise, it's me today, not Dr. Crawford. Figure I'd let him eat his lunch for a change. So today we're gonna look at the Neo Neo debate. And I put up a little image that I made over the long weekend instead of working on my own assignments. That on the left there, you can see that's Kenneth Waltz who wrote Why Iran Should Get the Bomb, one of the readings that you should have done. And on the right, you got Robert Cohane who wrote Hegemony and After, one of the readings that was supposed to happen we have shifted it a little bit, so don't feel too pressured if you haven't gotten around to that just yet. But anyways, we're gonna talk about the neo-neo debate for probably an hour, I wanna say. We'll see what we can get through. And right at the start, we have the word debate again, right? And the word debate is kind of contentious. There's a lot of debates on debates, and we've talked about that for a lot in this course already. So what is the debate between neo-realism and neoliberalism? So that's one of the mysteries that I'll hope to unpack, right? And uh, for those of you who, for whatever reason, still don't know who I am standing up here, I'm Justin, I'm your TA. I I should have done that first, but let's get started. Okay, so neoliberalism and neoliberalism, that's what we're gonna take a look at today. And so to kind of bring it back to what we talked about in the previous weeks and for most of September, we looked at the kind of differences between neorealism and classical realism, right? Classical realism espoused by Morgenthau would say that power is an ends. Whereas structural realism, like Waltz, Mearsheimer, it's a means in order to accomplish something in the international system. And one of the biggest ones is self-sufficient security. We want to be autarkic. We don't want to be reliant on other states in order to achieve security. So hopefully this all sounds pretty familiar. And so for neorealists, we have the structural condition of the world as being fundamentally beset by anarchy, right? We can't know that other states have good intentions or not. And if we mistrust, and if we don't put our trust correctly into other states, they're going to take us in the behind, right? We're gonna be insecure about the state in the world. And we talked about Athens and Sparta, right? The rise of Athenian power and fear that's created in Sparta. So a lot of structural conditions that we see in neoliberalism that this is mostly also the same thing, which again, goes back to the debate. Is it really a debate if they kind of start from the same path and just diverge on a bunch of different principles? So then we look at where liberalism kind of fits into this and adding on to that neoliberalism. So that's really what I wanna unpack in today's lecture. And I'm gonna do that in three particular ways. In the following. So, First, what I'm gonna do is hopefully discuss the explanatory level differences between neorealism and neoliberalism. We're gonna have neorealism on one side, which seeks to explain something, but then we also have neoliberalism, which seeks to do mostly the same thing, but in a different manner. And I'll go into that in just a bit. I also wanna discuss rationality and a bigger principle. You guys have talked about that from that supplementary lecture on Canvas with the stag hunt and the prisoner's dilemma, right? So I wanna unpack that a little further and look at some other case studies and how rational rationality really is. And we're gonna do that in two, uh, two cases. First, we're gonna do it with something called perfect information, which is kind of the neo-realist conception of things. And then we're gonna look at bounded rationality, which is a little more of a neoliberal concept. And then finally, we're gonna look at neoliberalism in the case of institutional importance. And they talk a lot about IOs and the importance of IOs in order to bridge this kind of security dilemma. We can have peace, we can have cooperation as long as IOs are present in the international system. And I'll talk about what they do and maybe if we have time, a little bit about their flaws as well. Because as you all know, IOs, like the World Health Organization in this current pandemic, are not perfect or efficient. Okay, so those are the goals of the lecture. And we'll start by talking about the differences between neorealism and neoliberalism. So the first thing is parsimony and explanatory power. So those are pretty abstract concepts. But essentially what this boils down to is that neorealism wants to be parsimonious. Kenneth Walt says that we should have less to explain. We should be more general so that we can explain things in various concepts. So the system level analysis, right? All states are homogenous. They're all rational actors. We're not looking at individual contexts. We're not looking at, for instance, Canada, and we're not looking at South Africa. No, they're just states. They're units. So it's very simple. 
as opposed to neoliberalism, which kind of looks to highlight those differences in a sort of greater capacity. They want to add more into this equation. So if neoliberalism is a system or a theory that kind of wants to be simple, neoliberalism wants to add a little bit more to this. And so what parsimony allows neoliberalism to do is it allows it to abstract reality. And so we see, for instance, one of the examples that I guess I'll draw on the board here is a map of the Canada line, right? And I guess transit's on my mind because there were some problems with transit this morning coming here. But essentially, this is what it looks like if you stare up at the Canada line, right? You've got YVR over here. You've got Richmond Breakhouse over here. you got Waterfront over there. Look familiar, more or less? Well, what's wrong with that, right? It's assuming that the distance between each station looks the same on that map. We know that's not true. But it's an abstraction from reality in order to serve a bigger purpose, which is to say, we want to just tell you what all the stops are. We don't really care what the distance exactly between each station is, right? So that's the abstraction from reality. And we know that's not true, right? So neoliberalism wants to explain things a little bit further, and they want to actually capture a few more variables inherent in the system. And they want to say, oh, look, you got the basic principles right, but we know there's that huge turn between Oak Ridge and King Edward where the train just starts squeaking like no tomorrow because it has to go around Queen Elizabeth Park. So we want to capture that in the system as well, right? So that's just one example of looking at parsimony versus explanatory power. And we'll talk about that when we get to rationality and what IOs do once we get to that. So neoliberalism we have here, we can kind of see this as an addition to neorealism. It gets a lot of things right. Anarchy, we like that. A state-centric focus, we do like that as well. We think states are primary actors. But what if we add a few more things into this equation? Then we can explain the world better, and we can kind of capture the sort of things that neorealists missed out on. So I'll give some examples of this principle in motion. So self-interest, that's a huge principle in neorealism. And it's likewise the same in neoliberalism. There's a lot of self-interest around. But states are able to cooperate and push away anarchy to a certain extent. How do they achieve this cooperation? I've already said it, but one example, a big example, is international institutions, IOs. And what they do for neoliberals is that it obtains collective outcomes now. States don't have to be self-reliant. We can collaborate in an IO where it wouldn't have been possible in neorealism to accomplish this collective outcome. We can get the stag. We don't have to survive on a hair. I know your intentions now. It's less unclear. We can work together, get the stag, forget the hair. We can get better dinner tonight or turkey, whatever you want. So am I going too fast? Anyone need me to go back? Yeah. Yes, I can. There will be a section where I do need to make changes to it because of the way that PowerPoint works or doesn't work. Um, so I might have to edit it a little bit before I post it. Okay, so there's a little bit of a pushback here. Neoliberals, again, they want to add a little bit more to this theory of neorealism. Most of it is correct, but we want to be a little more specific in what we're trying to do. And neorealists would protest against this because we have something that works according to Waltz and Mearsheimer, right? It's a parsimonious theory for a reason. We don't want to add too much to it and overload what neorealism is trying to accomplish. So that's a little point of contention there. Neoliberals want to add more to it, but neorealists think that the whole point of this theory is to be a little more abstract and a little more vague so that it can capture more general level things, right? So parsimony is a better concept for neorealism. Fewer variables in this equation of how we're trying to explain the world and how it works, it means we lead to a more simplistic theory, and so it's more easily conceptualizable.
And this is something that I think you'll see in social science in general. A lot of you are in IR majors. So if you do end up taking a quantitative methods course at any point, you'll probably see that you can do a lot of things with different variables, but sometimes you want to shorten it down to just a few in order to make your theory work a little better. I'm sure some of you at some point have seen or come across one of your readings which says, well, I'm going to look at these 12 variables, and then I'll look at 15 hypotheses, and then I'll look at five exceptions. That's a bit boring to get through. It's very confusing. It's very complicated. We could do more with less. So it's, a, again, the word debate. It is a debate in social science in general. That's something that you're certainly not going to be limited to coming across here in IR theory. You'll see it everywhere as well. And so moving on to this next section here, we're going to look at rationality. So both theories, neorealism and neoliberalism, do look at rationality. And they agree that states are motivated by a rational concept of utility, maximization. But they do differ in some ways. And I'm going to spend a lot of time here going exactly through how this occurs. So before I do that, any questions so far? OK. Let's just wait for a few seconds. OK, rationality. Again, we're going to look at exactly how rational this, these two theories really are. We want to focus on the assumptions that they're making. We want to kind of unpack a lot of the methodology behind rationality. So let's dive into it. In realism, you guys discussed the stag hunt that was made popular by Rousseau. It's an example of an assurance game where we want to be assured that the other player is going for the stag and not for the hare. Because if they're going for the hare, and we're going for the stag, we're not going to catch anything. We're not going to get dinner tonight. And then we have the prisoner's dilemma as well, which you guys talked about, where it's in their utility maximizing interest to cooperate together. But because of this concept of rationality, they actually end up taking the worst option for both of them. So at face value, that already doesn't seem very rational, right? So we'll get to that. And I'll look at an example of the prisoner's dilemma game using something that everyone in IR has seen at some point, which is a study on the Cold War and mutually assured destruction. It's a classic. So I'm going to unpack this a little bit. And I'll start with explaining some of the constraints here. There are two principal actors in this model, the USA and the USSR. And already, we're looking at parsimony here. Because during the Cold War, there are, of course, other actors, right? the non-aligned movement. They're going to have some impact that is not negligible in this equation. But for the sake of just looking at big powers, we're just going to focus on two players so it doesn't overcomplicate our example of rationality. A nuclear conflict, we're going to assume to be a single play game, meaning that it's only played once. I mean, if you have enough nukes to destroy the world 10 times over, I'd, I'd imagine that it's only played once as well. But this does avoid some issues in rational choice theory. And so there is a disclaimer on the following material. We are going to look at some basic math. And by basic math, I will tell you, is 100 bigger than 4? We got a no. All right. Excellent. You'll be right up there in mathematics as a major. They talk about all sorts of abstract material. Yeah, you know, I think I will make this part of the exam. So if you can only integrate the following equation, then you'll get to pass poly 367. I think I'll take it up with the head. OK, so don't worry. Long story short, don't worry about this next material. It's just an example to help guide you through what rationality is and how we can better look at it. OK, so our first example is the USA and the USSR. They, for the sake of simplicity, again, we assume that both of them have the same amount of nukes. There are two choices that each actor can make. They can attack, which is self-explanatory, I hope, or they can retaliate. And retaliate, in this case, means that they want to watch, and they're going to wait for an attack. So something like a detente, which historically is what ended up happening, right? But in this case, if an attack does come, it'll be too late to actually retaliate, because all your nukes are gone. You've just been bombed before you can launch a retaliation attack. So, Hopefully, people have seen this before. This is the matrix for a game. And we have player A as the USA. We have player B as the USSR. And so their payoffs 
what their utility gained from attacking or retaliating is listed in parentheses there as A and B. So USA's payoff and then the USSR's payoff. USSR's payoff. So that's not very bright, but you can see here that this payoff here refers to the USA attacking and the USSR ret retaliating. So that would be their payoff for whatever that decision is. And I'll populate this with numbers in just a second. But is everyone on board so far? OK. So now I've just opened up A. These are the payoffs for the USA. Could I get a brave volunteer from the audience to tell me what the highest utility the USA would get is in terms of points? You can yell out the answer. Yes. Yes. Of course, we don't know whether the USSR wants that strategy because I've hidden it, but that is what the USA wants. You're correct. They would maximize their utility if they attacked and the USSR was caught sleeping on the job. And of course, that's another assumption. Does the USA want nuclear war? Here, I've said yes, but that's an assumption that you can definitely challenge. So they get the most utility if they attack and the USSR retaliates, they get one point, they win. So now I've populated the USSR one, and I'll just answer this question quickly. The USSR would maximize its utility if it attacked and the USA was caught sleeping. So how do we read this game now? Well, we're gonna look for an equilibrium, and I said before that this is an example of the prisoner's dilemma, right? The most optimal outcome for both parties based on this example, is zero, zero. Both states are engaged in detente and they don't actually attack one another. But as we've seen before in the case of the prisoner's dilemma, this is not the case because of how rationality works. And so the third assumption that we're gonna make in this model here is that both parties know what the payoffs of each other are. And that's a very huge assumption to make because Let's say you're doing the stag and hunt game that Rousseau was talking about. How can we be sure? How can we know that they are going for the hunt? How do we know uh, that they're going for the stag or the hare? We don't know. It's very difficult to get perfect information, and that's one of the biggest assumptions in rational choice theory, especially when it comes to states. Are states deciding things using one person's mind? Probably not. There's a whole lot of bureaucracy going on. There's some inefficiency. Maybe there's constraints involved, right? Maybe if they're democratic or authoritarian. So it's very hard to gauge a state's intentions in such a clear-cut manner as we see in rationality. So that's already a first caution that I'm gonna make using this model. But anyways, let's talk about what the USA wants to do. So I put there in highlighting what they're going to do as their optimal strategy. And how we read this is by looking at what the other player is going to do. So the USSR, like I said, has two choices. It can attack or it can retaliate. And if they attack, if we look over here, we see that the USA could choose to attack back, getting the minus one points, or they could choose to retaliate and get blown up. They lose. So in that scenario, they're gonna pick whichever is gonna maximize their utility. They're gonna attack back. And both players get minus one as a result. Still with me? Okay. Now the second strategy is that the USSR could actually choose to retaliate. And the USA, seeing that, has two options. It can also retaliate in the position of detente, or it can attack and get one point, zero and one. One is bigger than zero, so in this case, it's going to attack the USSR. And those would be the USA strategies, and for those of you who have seen game theory before, that's called a dominant strategy when the USA pursues one option unilaterally, irrespective of what another player chooses to do. Okay, so we talked about the USA's options. No surprise, the USSR, because this is a prisoner's dilemma, they're gonna do the same thing. Now, if we look at the USA's example here, they have two strategies, attacking and retaliating, and if the USA attacks, the USSR has two options of attacking back, getting them minus one, or retaliating, getting them minus 100. To nobody's surprise, if they're maximizing their utility, they will attack. And the same thing, if USA retaliates, the USSR says, hey, you know, that's free real estate. I'm gonna attack. And so they get one point from that. And if we put those highlighted portions together, 
we're going to get our equilibrium of minus one and minus one, which is inefficient compared to the socially acceptable equilibrium of zero, zero, a detente. So already in rationality, we all know that that model that I just presented isn't what happened in real life. We had a detente. We had the acceptable outcome. Why is that? The equilibrium is proved to be false. So we're going to take a look at that more and explain how this came to be. Any questions about this slide? Did I go a little too fast? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, as countries like the U.S. and Israel develop technologies like the Iron Dome that make like other people's attacking you know, points smaller because you know we can be stupid and we don't need that. Um, does that kind of like defeat the purpose of like liberal rationality? It's an excellent question. And you've managed to successfully predict my next slide in a certain way. I didn't do it based on the Israel example, but we're going to look at that. So for those of you who couldn't hear, what, what actions do defensive technologies aimed at shooting down missiles do to this model? Right? So let's skip ahead here, and let's go into the next example, which is basically what you said but in the 70s and the 80s. So same model, same amount of nukes on both sides, but this time we assume that the USA has constructed a laser defense system that's going to shoot down 50% of missiles that are launched against them. So the question that I'm posing now is, is this going to make mutually assured destruction more likely, less likely, or even the same? Anybody want to hazard a guess? More likely? Why, why is that? Why isn't deterrence effective anymore? Um, or no, uh, offensive, like a first rate offensive program is not an advantage. Okay. And because the first strike advantage is no longer present, then it gives the other state who would have been attacked first an advantage in that sense that the other state wouldn't have. There's an asymmetry going on. Right. So basically, right on the money there, it's going to make mutually assured destruction more likely, possibly. Right? Again, we're assuming that nothing else changes besides the 50% uh, shooting down of missiles because of this laser defense system. So this was our previous equilibrium, minus 1 and minus 1 in the prisoner's dilemma. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce this defense system. What is it going to do to the payoffs? Well, the USSR only blows up half of the US now, right? So if it chooses to attack, what's going to happen to its payoffs? It's going to go down. It now only gets right from minus 1 and 1. It goes to minus 2 and 0 0.5. It gets less for blowing up the US if it chooses to attack. And on the flip side, the USA doubles its advantage if it chooses a policy of attacking or retaliating when the USSR attacks. Right? They can attack and only suffer half the casualties or they can retaliate and only suffer half the losses to the US. And of course, this implies that something like a nuclear winter would not happen, which would kill the rest of the world. So I'll skip to the equilibrium here. We get the exact same one. We get attacking and attacking. Rationality has locked us into this path of, if I don't attack, they're going to jump me first. So I better attack as well. So we get this strange scenario where in rational choice theory, according to neorealists and perfect information, this actually doesn't change anything. Defensive systems actually make it paradoxically more likely for attack to occur because the losses suffered by the US would be smaller. That's a strange scenario. And maybe this explains why the arms race that happened during the Cold War built up as much as it did. Because going back to what you said, if I build up more nuclear weapons, then my first strike capabilities get larger. And that forces other states to really consider whether they want to try this or not. And this is where we draw the link back to why Iran should get the bomb, according to Kenneth Waltz. It may sound strange, but increasing offensive capability in this context seems to, in rational choice theory, improve a detente chance. Any questions at all?
Okay. So I'll just wait for people to finish up here. Okay. And so we see, and we can conclude from neorealism that the reliance on rationality doesn't exactly lend to optimistic scenarios. It didn't predict detente using rational choice theory, but detente is exactly what happened. So there are other things at play here that neorealism maybe wasn't able to capture successfully. And neoliberalism, seeing that, builds on that. Why didn't it work? Maybe we can add a few more variables that we're missing, and that'll give us a solution to this problem of why we want to have peace in the world despite anarchic conditions. And the personality trait of rational choice theory is that it's fairly deterministic, right? We have two options. You can only have two options, attack, retaliate. That's pretty deterministic, right? It's not probabilistic. Are states really fully rational? Do they have this perfect information where they see the USA head of state looks over at USSR and says, ah, they're getting one point if they attack us and if we don't do anything. Sometimes you don't get that information. Sometimes there's uncertainty involved in this equation. And because of uncertainty, if we add this in, in addition to something like random error, we're going to get a different looking model, and that's exactly what neoliberalism kind of projects. We don't get full information. We get something called bounded rationality, where we are rational using what we have. We don't know everything about the world. We can't hope to know everything about the world. The most we can do is just use what we have. So an example of random error in this kind of example, again, Going back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, I don't know if anyone is familiar with this story, but there was that submarine who erroneously received a communication from the Soviet Union telling them that the USA had just fired their nuclear missiles and it was time to retaliate. The submarine didn't do it because it knew or it thought that it was an error. And if it hadn't, I don't know if I'd be standing here giving this lecture. So that's an example of random error that rational choice theory may or may not project successfully. So you want to be careful with deterministic claims here. OK, so shifting gears now into how rationality plays out in neoliberalism, we first start with an example of bounded rationalism. So this is taken from Cohen's text, After Hegemony. Look at this. It's another artifact in your IR course, freshly excavated. And what Cohen says is that classical rationality is an idealization. Look at that. He's saying that neorealists who love classical rationality are idealistic. Have you heard of that? A realist being called an idealist. How the turntables. <laughs> it makes more sense to view individuals, and especially governments, as constrained in their abilities to make calculations. And it is costly for them to gather information and to make decisions. That sounds about right. It sounds more accurate. We know that governments don't have full information. We know that when the Canadian government tried to hold an election, they thought they would get a majority. They didn't. They don't have perfect information, and despite what the polls were telling them, they didn't get perfect information. And so we see some uncertainty involved with rationality. Now we know that we can be rational with what we have, but there's going to be a little bit of variance involved. We can't pay attention to everything. There's a scarcity of attention. Microeconomists love that word, scarcity. Actors can't maximize utility because they don't have perfect information. They can only make do with what they have. Everyone good on that? Anyone need me to go back? Okay, so how does neoliberalism then envision bounded rationality and imperfect information in the system? So now we introduce something new, the presence of international organizations, that's crucial for Cohen and neoliberalism in general. With IOs, what we can do is provide more information to other actors. We can signal intentions in a different forum and that gives us more information on what the decision-making process of each state really is. So an example 
for a few examples of IOs, right? You have the GATT that goes into the WTO. You have the World Bank. You have the IMF, different kinds of economic IOs. And you have the World Health Organization, several examples of IOs. And these all operate, according to neoliberalism, on the constraints of bounded rationality. But they help bridge uncertainty between states. What are the monetary policies of one state? Is it really going to be pursuing a certain choice of action? You wouldn't know that unless there was an IO that helped give us that information and therefore inform our own decision-making process. So there it is. It allows actors to bridge uncertainty, and it does make cooperation a little more feasible than it would have been for neorealism, who would have just kind of laughed at this concept. But I'll say more about what neorealism has to say on IOs in a later set of slides. Okay. So, in one of your readings in the textbook, it talked about Kantian liberalism, right? Liberalism can achieve peace through several aspects that neorealism wouldn't really consider. We can overcome the security dilemma and achieve peace through the following three methods. Economic interdependence, democracy, and of course, the presence of IOs. Sounds very good. We can overcome the security dilemma if all of these you know, to some extent, are present. But there are problems, of course, with this approach. And this goes, again, back to our concept of idealism as well. For every free trade agreement that you sign, making you more economically interdependent, you might get a trade war. For every democracy that you might see, it raises another question about whether democratic peace theory really is accurate and whether there's no third variable introduced that leads to peace rather than democracy. And finally, for IOs, the biggest question of all, when we think about anarchy, what does that mean? A lack of central authority over states, right, in the international system? Well, if that's the case, then if we have an IO like the UN, how do we get states to do what the IO tells them to do? Non-compliance is probably one of the biggest issues in international law because we can't really do binding resolutions in most contexts unless there's something else at play. So non-compliance is always a risk. So we'll leave those first two aside. And for the remainder, I'm just really going to be focusing on IOs here. There's a lot to get through for what IOs do in neoliberalism and how they help the international system achieve cooperation. So we'll focus on that. I'll bring that back for a second. Okay, so now progressing into international organizations, we want to ask the big question, how do neorealists view them? You might get some different answers, but the general consensus, or I shouldn't say consensus, but the general perspective is that they can exist. Nothing's stopping them from existing, but they don't really have much purpose to their existence beyond just immediately being captured by great powers and used as a tool for great power politics. That's just another example of the tragedy of great power politics, like someone like Mearsheimer would say. So then this raises the question of whether that viewpoint is really accurate. It's quite pessimistic. We have IOs, but you can't trust them because what they're going to do is they're just going to be captured and then great powers will use them to their advantage. Is that true? Do we see this today? Anyone have any examples? Yeah? Right. Can you name a few examples of the veto powers? Um, like the United States like vetoing something that mm -hmm. uh, was like condemning Israel, for example. Mm -hmm. Do you have something? Yeah. Yeah. 
in addition, there was also that incident where they refused to acknowledge Taiwan's approach to dealing with the pandemic and refused to even name Taiwan or engage in that conversation. Right. So we have examples where IOs are made inefficient because of this existence of great power dynamics, right? And you mentioned the P5, the permanent five, that veto power, right? France is in there. When has France been a great power? Maybe at some point when the organization was created, that was one of the constraints needed for France to join. But it's pretty anachronistic because now today, you see that they have the veto power and it doesn't really reflect, uh, reflect great power politics as much as it maybe would have 100 years ago. So that's something else to consider, right? How great powers use that as a sort of back door in order to leverage, going back to Archimedes, how do they leverage this international system to their advantage? So we've concluded then that neorealism does have something to say about IOs, just that they're pretty constrained by great power politics, so we can't be unrealistic about what they can or can't do. Okay, so now for neoliberalism. What do IOs do for neoliberalism? And how would they respond to this neorealist argument? Well, first of all, IOs, the major function for neoliberalism is to lower transaction costs, right? The costs of doing business or to negotiate, for states to negotiate with one another. It lowers this cost. It turns solitary interactions, single play games, if you want to use that word, into repeated interactions. We see each other a lot more. And in doing so, what this does is it lowers uncertainty. If I see somebody all the time, then I'm going to get a better grasp of what their intentions are. I get a better sense of how they operate as a state, what their decision-making processes are like. So it reduces uncertainty, which is a big question that I posed just now for rational choice theory. And so it gives us a greater chance of figuring out what the intentions of other players are. Also, on a more technical note, it also increases the convenience for states to meet through the I.O. Instead of sending somebody to another country's embassy, now we can meet all together in one forum and discuss the latest rounds of sanctions or the latest security developments, what have you. So it lowers transaction costs. That's one of the big points of I.O.s. <clears throat> it also provides something called a linkage of interests. I won't say too much about this because we'll get to what this really does when we get to regime theory and constructivism. But suffice it to say that IOs, if you have joint membership in an IO, so if I'm part of the UNSC, I'm part of the World Trade Organization, sometimes my economic interests will coincide with my security interests. And what that does is it links your interests together so that in your negotiations, they're a little bit more linked when you're dealing with other states. For questions about beliefs and preferences, those can change, but we'll get to that in our later theories. And so returning to that question of what neo-realists would consider as the main defining principle for IOs is that they're being captured by great power politics. And neoliberalism says that, yes, that is true, but you're missing this because we're looking at it in two ways. Again, parsimony versus explanatory level power. We can look at great power politics through two ways. We can see how less powerful states can form coalitions together and then exercise influence over stronger states. That can happen. Or on the flip side, we might have a more powerful state that uses an IO to lock in commitments for smaller states. And I call this voluntary defanging. They willingly constrain themselves a little bit to signal their intention that they mean no harm to these, lower, uh, to these smaller states, and that secures compliance. So remember, the big question for neorealism was, how can we be sure that the intentions are genuine? Well, if I willingly constrain myself, that should send out a pretty strong signal that I am being credible with my statement. I want to secure your compliance, and I'm willing to go as far as constraining myself a bit in order to get your compliance. Yeah, sorry. It could be. Neoliberalism doesn't necessarily acknowledge it one way or the other. They would just say that, look, backdoors can and do exist, but 
whether we assume that ulterior motives are involved, at the end of the day, we still see this, and that's something that would be something that neorealism wouldn't really consider, right? If you have power, why are you giving it up? That would be kind of the neorealist conception of it, whereas neoliberalism would look at the last example, as I'm, I'm assuming that's what you're referring to, and they would say, okay, why are we seeing that? We shouldn't see that. The USA, after 1945, should just hang on to their power. They have a nuclear monopoly for a short, term, uh, for a short time. They can just use that to secure compliance. But we don't actually see that. So there's a question as to why that occurs, and I'll get to that. Sorry, does that answer your question a bit? Not really. <laughs> do, do you want to rephrase your question? OK. Any other questions? OK. So going into these principles a little more in depth, we have a reduction of transaction costs. So referring to single play games, again, that terminology, we turn that solitary interaction into a repeated or an iterated interaction. And like I said before, what that does is it reduces uncertainty, it increases the clarity of each other's intentions, and it makes the prospects of cooperation actually mutually beneficial for everyone. So going back to our prisoner's dilemma example, we know that the equilibrium is for both parties to defect. We can, we can imagine this now as some sort of international agreement, maybe on the environment. It's good for everyone to cooperate, but we're not going to do that because it's rational for all of us to defect. And so we end up with minus one on both sides as opposed to five points, which would have been more preferable to both of us. But now, with an I.O., we turn that single play game into a repeated interaction. I love putting this in. If you ever see this in an I.O. reading, you know, you might flip out too, but the proof is trivial and left as an exercise to the reader. What a horrible thing to write. Um, so we see this same game, but now through an iterated repetition or repetition of this game, we actually introduce the concept of reciprocity. Now we can gauge each other's interests and work together slowly over time. And this allows us to escape the prisoner's dilemma because now we're operating under a constraint that, look, if you cheat me once, if you defect from this, then we're all gonna defect from now on forevermore. And all of us are gonna end up with minus one. But if I see the other player cooperating, now I'm gonna cooperate too. And this pattern continues, right? And through a mathematical proof, we can end up, so long as they value the future, they will end up with cooperation that is sustained. Okay. So going back again, moving on to the more convenience aspect of transaction costs, instead of having states engage in bilateral or multilateral diplomacy, IOs can create a sort of forum, making it more convenient for states to kind of meet and negotiate the you know, economic interests, right? You can have the G20 meeting together at a summit, whether or not they accomplish anything is up for debate, but they, the fact is they do meet, whereas they would have to convene by themselves without the presence of this kind of IO or institution. And it also is facilitated by more technical aspects like secretariats and subcommittees, right? So all this bureaucratic procedure this also helps make a more efficient organizational structure. Okay, so again, for interest linkage, I won't go too much into this, but when you have joint membership, if one state is a part of multiple IOs and the other state that is dealing with is also part of multiple IOs that the same one is part of, then you're going to get issues where, look, I'm willing to concede a little bit on my security interests if you give me some leeway on these economic interests. And so you get this kind of interest linkage where now cooperation is sustained because it's going through an IO, whereas otherwise you'd be deal dealing with that bilaterally. And so we'll get into this a little more once we get to regime theory, norms, that sort of thing. <clears throat> 
Okay, so now we return back to this question of great power politics. And it doesn't necessarily dismiss IO importance, it just adds a little caveat. So remember that neorealism just dismisses IOs because it's just going to be captured by great powers in order to fulfill their interests. We're not going to see meaningful cooperation. It could be manipulation, right? And so neoliberalism doesn't deny that, but it says that IOs can still be useful, contrary to what neorealists think. We can have cooperation despite the presence of power asymmetry. And that goes both ways for strong states to secure smaller states' compliance and vice versa. Should I go back? So now our first scenario is with the WTO and BRICS, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, the rising formerly developing states that are now economic powers in their own right. And so these are considered to be the less powerful states grouping together and exercising a sort of bargaining influence, leverage, again, returning to Archimedes. They can leverage more powerful states into getting compliance for what they're actually trying to achieve. So historically, we look at the WTO and over time, right, we start in 1973 when we had developing state members initially dissatisfied at the way that great powers were dominating the discourse. We had the Quad, which was at the time the USA, the EU, Japan, and Canada. They were dominating the discussion. They were vetoing things left and right. And so developing countries had no say at the table. So that's an example of how great power politics, again, neorealists would look at that and say, well, what were you expecting? These guys are powerful. Of course they're going to veto you. And so when we get to 1986 to 94 at the Uruguay round, Brazil and India, two countries with part of BRICS, they tried to take a more active role by submitting so many proposals at this round. They tried to submit over 50%. They were ignored because they're developing states. Again, neorealists would look at that and say, well, what were, what were you expecting? But then we get to 1999 the Seattle Ministerial Conference. And that was the moment where they couldn't pass anything on the table because the balance of power had shifted slightly. And Brazil and India realized that they had the leverage to block the Quad from simply passing whatever they wanted. Another example that you might think of was back in the 1960s with the non-aligned movement. You had to not only go up, up against the other superpower in the USA or the USSR, but now you had a third movement whom you wanted to get international compliance from. So from 1999, that was the watershed moment, and we transitioned into 2004 in Cancun, when the USA and the EU realized that suddenly their bargaining position was compromised. And now Brazil and India, despite being relatively still smaller at that time, they were definitely bigger than Japan and Canada. And so they were allowed to join the Quad and replace that kind of position at the table. And yeah, this is something, of course, that we don't see in every I.O. The permanent five at the UNSC, I talked about that. You can ask all you want for France to leave the table. Sorry, I'm picking on France. You can ask France all you want, but they're not going to give that up. They have veto power. They're not going to give that up. So this is something that we do see in some scenarios and some that we don't see in others. But what this all comes down to is that it's an example of an I.O. where you have smaller states with inferior bargaining positions that still are able to secure international collective outcomes where they wouldn't have before, without the existence of this institution where they can band together and block the Quad from exercising their economic power. And so we have a few members of BRICS that supplant existing powers, and so this bypasses this area of great power blockage. 
to read that as W three O slash gap or yes. or accurately gap W three O because this is still the gap. Yeah. It's still the general agreement on Paris and Freddy is still ninety five. So the Uruguay the Tokyo and Uruguay rounds are the gap rounds. But then in ninety five we we're moving forward from ninety five to W three O. I mean, I know you know that. Nice. Yeah, sorry, shorthand. Everyone good? Okay, so that was one example. And now we turn to the other one, where we have a larger state voluntary, voluntarily constraining itself a little bit in order to secure international compliance from smaller states. So the example that I'm going to look at is the USA post-1945 and NATO. And so, of course, we talked about this in previous lectures with the Pax Americana. The USA emerges after post-1945 as the new hegemon. Two things. States wanted assurance on American intentions regarding what they were going to do to the international system. Are they going to make major changes? Are we just going to be left alone as part of the status quo? We want to know what America is doing. Again, returning to bounded rationality, without the presence of IOs, it becomes less clear what America really is trying to do. Cheap talk is something that could definitely happen, especially since America is a hegemon. But the important thing is that USA also wanted smaller states' compliance with their designs on the international system. Yes, America had a nuclear monopoly at a time. But how effective is it if it goes up to a belligerent state, let's say Canada, for the sake of hypotheticals, said, you know, we're not going to support you on this. Is America going to start pointing nukes at it until it changes it, its position? And if so, is it going to keep doing that for everything that Canada is not willing to budge on? It's very costly to do that, right? It's very costly to coerce other states repeatedly. And so it's much easier to secure their long-term commitment. So the USA, as the new hegemon, has the power to set up IOs and what they want to do with those is constrain other states into predictable policy orbits. Again, what we return to is this notion of bounded rationality. It's hard to figure out what other states are doing, but if they join this IO, they're constrained to acting in more predictable manners. But the costs of this involve lowering its own policy autonomy. As we all know in neorealist thought, sovereignty is fundamental. So anything that lowers a state's sovereignty, well, that's unfeasible for neorealism. A state would never do that. And yet, when we look at NATO in a second, this still happened, right? And again, that goes back to what I said just now. They could have coerced other states bilaterally or multilaterally into the favorable outcomes that it wanted. But this would incur significant costs, and they can't keep it up forever. So in what Eikenberry, one of the authors that I think we haven't read at all this term, anyways, Eikenberry refers to this as the institutional bargain. And so the USA grudgingly agreed to several concessions that constrained itself so long as this secured compliance from other states in the process. And the biggest example of that is NATO and Article 5. Can anyone remind me what Article 5 is in NATO? Yes? If one member state takes a pass on everyone has to choose to provide different. An attack on one is an attack on all. The USA definitely didn't want that. You see that in World War I, where they didn't want to enter the war until the war came to them. And you see that in World War II. They didn't want to enter the war. The war came to them on December 7th, 1941. And so we see that NATO is one example of this institutional bargain. On one hand, you have the USA that agrees grudgingly to provide that kind of support. But this is in return to be able to stabilize the European economy and also integrate it, and also containing Germany at the same time. So securing compliance, but at the cost of some policy autonomy. Any questions on this part? Okay. Okay, so we're moving on into this final section here. So to recap, 
IOs are fundamental for neorealism, or not neorealism, neoliberalism. And it's part of an answer to neorealism's pessimism regarding how to get security in an anarchical system. The four areas, it lowers transaction costs and it reduces uncertainty. So now our rational calculations operating on bounded rationality, they are improved somewhat with the existence of IOs. We also have joint interest linkage. If I'm part of multiple IOs, then I can link several interests to each other and therefore secure cooperation in some sort of package deal. It allows less powerful states to secure collective outcomes. And it also allows more powerful states to secure favorable outcomes. So we see at the end of the day that we can get cooperation facilitated through IOs, whereas neorealism would say, we have anarchy. I'm sorry, there's simply very little ways around it, if at all. And so we get neoliberalism adding something to the equation. We can get cooperation. All right, so we'll wrap up with a question mark after hegemony. Cohen does not have a question mark in his title. I put one there. And the reason why is because I want to talk about the longevity of IOs. How sustainable are they? Do they really last? So going back to the example of the Pax Americana, when they set up a bunch of IOs after World War II had ended, do they really last when America's dominance in the international system regresses a bit? How sustainable are IOs? When we see regional organizations like the ADB, the Asian Development Bank, in that corner of the world, as opposed to global IOs. So what we see is a potential fracturing of the system, but you can also make an argument to say that IOs can sustain. They just adapt over time. And so Cohen goes into that a little bit, and he talks about what happens when you know, American interests are no longer the de facto position. What's good for America is good for the world, vice versa. What happens after that? What happens after hegemony? or hegemony and after, as it's titled in your reading. So how stable are these idols really going to be when you have emerging great powers, BRICS, right, especially China in today's international system? How stable are those idols when you have a challenger that wants to change the status quo? Can neo realists in this neo-neo debate be correct when it comes to great power politics? Do we see that great power politics have become more prevalent in capturing what IOs are meant to do in the system? So recall that I started this lecture by saying that power, right, for classical realism and then structural realism, power is a little bit different. Power is a means for structural, real, uh, structural realism. And if that's the case, then maybe we can make an argument that IOs are a means for neoliberalism, a means to achieve international cooperation in an anarchic system. And so the final part is whether IOs can be part of a collective convergence. I talked and I hinted at joint interest linkage, but whether we get IOs that turn rationality into a concept where defection is no longer thinkable, right? It's no longer plausible to imagine that somebody would defect in this agreement. Is there a way for IOs to accomplish that? Or will there always be a case where great powers can upset the sort of equilibrium? So those questions after hegemony is what I'll end this lecture on. We've seen that neorealism and neoliberalism have different things to say about say, the same principles. But whether or not you think that one theory is better than another kind of depends on what you're trying to capture. Are you trying to capture a parsimonious outlook on the world like you would in neorealism? Or are you trying to look at more institutional dynamics and a little more context behind different power levels of states or what their role is in an institution. So that's where I'll end off. Any questions? How are we doing on time?
1.30. I think I said it was going to be an hour, so. Punctuality. Put that on the evaluate. No, just joking. 